OK, thank you everyone for joining. Welcome to this webinar on the Geography Admissions Test. Um, my name is Dan. I'm the Outreach Officer for the School of Geography and the Environment at the University of Oxford. Um, so I know um, the audience today will be made up of a, a mixture of um, prospective undergraduates, uh, perhaps some family members um, and a few teachers uh, and advisors too. Um, so don't worry, I'll be I'll be well aware that the questions at the end might come from any of those perspectives. Um, I'll be kind of talking to you as if as if you're the applicant taking taking the test, but I know that um, some of you may be uh, in this session so that you can pass on information to other people, uh, and that's absolutely fine. Um, the format of this session um, will be, um, I'm going to talk through what the admissions test is, um, how it's structured, um, and then talk through a couple of the questions uh, from one of the specimen papers. Um, I'm going to assume that you can see my slides OK, um, so you should see the, the introduction slide at the moment. If not, please uh, do pop something in the chat, um, but that should be working uh, now. Um, just a reminder that this session is being recorded um, so, uh, so that we can distribute the recording to anyone who missed the session um, and the recording will also be um, put on our YouTube channel. Um, so if you're not comfortable with that, then please do leave the session now. Um, otherwise, we will make a start. Um, I've allowed until half five for this session, but we may well uh, finish earlier. That depends on, on how many uh, how many questions there are. So let's make a start then. Um, first of all, what is the geography admissions test or the gap? Um, so if you're applying for undergraduate study in geography uh, from this year, you'll be required to sit the GATT. Um, the GATT is designed so that candidates should, should find it equally challenging, regardless of where you've studied or what school examinations uh, you are taking. And the GATT is a new test for this year. Uh, so that has, uh, you know, some implications for, you know, uh, past papers and that kind of thing. There are no past papers because it's a new test for this year. So what do we have a geography admissions test then? Well, um, admissions tests um, across different subjects at Oxford help us to choose between the many, many well qualified candidates um, that we receive applications from. Um, it's an extra piece of information uh, that we have as part of your application, but there is no specific mark to guarantee that your application will be shortlisted. So it's not a pass or fail. There's no uh, mark that will uh, uh, that you necessarily need to hit. Um, the tests vary each year uh, and your school will be considered alongside the scores of other applicants, um, which you know links to the point about that not being a, a specific score is because uh, you're being judged um, alongside everyone else who applies uh, at the same time as you. Um, the GATT will help us to understand applicants' abilities relevant to the skills that we think are important for undergraduate geography students. And I'll talk about those skills in just a second. It's not necessary to have studied geography as a subject at GCSE or A level or any equivalent uh, to do well in the test uh, and no specific knowledge or facts are required of applicants other than you know very 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 rudimentary um, uh, sort of common sense knowledge. Um, so you don't need to have done geography at school to apply uh, and the test is designed in such a way that no matter uh, the educational background uh, of someone taking the test um, everyone uh, should have a sort of equal equal chance at it. Um, so what does the GAT assess? So those skills that I mentioned that we think uh, we want to see in uh, applicants, competitive applicants to the geography course, um, critical thinking, problem solving, uh, and essay writing in response to unseen material. And they, those are all skills that are really important for, for our undergraduate course. Um, in terms of the format of the GAT, it's a computer based test and candidates will input their answers directly into the online platform. Uh, candidates will take the test in a registered test centre, um, and this is uh, for most people that will be their school. Uh, th the test is one hour and 45 minutes long and comprised of three parts, A, B and C. So part A, uh, part A tests critical thinking. Uh, it should take around 30 minutes. Uh, so I should say that the, the guidelines of, of the timings our guidelines, you won't be timed out of the sections um, automatically by the system. Uh, that's just what we recommend you, sp you spend on it. Uh, so it should take around 30 minutes. Uh, there are two subsections, 
each subsection requires you to read a passage and then answer five multiple choice questions. So you do um, the first subsection, read the passage, answer five questions. Second subsection, uh, answer five multiple choice questions. The, those passages can be published articles. Uh, so for example, from websites, magazines, online journals, or passages that are created specifically for the test. Uh, so um, on the specimen papers, um, you will see that some of them have um, you know, a title and a link to articles from uh, from sources online and uh, an author, um, whereas some passages don't have an author, uh, don't have any kind of uh, reference information, and that's because those passages would have been created specifically for the test. Part B, um, Part B tests problem solving. Again, should take around 30 minutes. And again, is split into two subsections, each requiring candidates to look at some information uh, and then answer five multiple choice questions. Uh, this time, though, the information, rather than a kind of written uh, passage, will be in the form of a graph, a chart, a map, uh, a table of data, something like that. And then finally, part C, um, this will require you to read a passage of text uh, and answer an essay question in response to that text. And it should take around 45 minutes. There's a word limit of 750 words for this, um, but this is not a target. If you write less than this, it may still work, may still well be a, a very good answer. So how do you prepare for the GAT then? Well, no specific knowledge or facts are required. Uh, and as I mentioned, you're not required to have done geography at school to do well in the test. Um, so you can't really revise a knowledge for it. Um, so uh, the best thing you can do is familiarise yourself with the format and style of the questions. Um, you shouldn't really need any coaching um, and you can prepare well enough using the notes on uh, on the university website and the specimen papers. So we recommend that you familiarise yourself with the online system before the test. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about that later on. Um, remember to sort of plan your time and, and try your best to keep to the suggested timings that we've given you. Read the question carefully uh, and check your work. As it's a new test, there are no past papers, but there are the two specimen papers on the website. Um, you will see them on the on, under the practice materials tab on the GAT webpage on the university website. Um, and uh, so there's specimen paper A, specimen paper B, and then there's solutions A, solutions B. So there's answers with with commentary explaining why that is the answer as well. Um, one of those specimen papers is uh, uploaded to the online system as a kind of practice, so you can have a go uh, on the online system as if you're actually taking the test. Uh, but do bear in mind that that online system does not take any submission or store any answers, so you won't get any marks back from that. Um, there's no suggested reading for the test. There's no nothing that we say you should read um, in advance of doing the test. So let's have a look at some questions then. Um, so part A. Um, critical thinking. So what is critical thinking? Well, critical thinking tests candidates ability to summarise the main conclusion in an argument, identify an assumption, assess the impact of additional evidence, detect reasoning errors or apply general principles. So it's about your ability to assess the arguments of others and, and make judgments. So definitely really try and think carefully about what the author is really arguing. Um, and think about are some of the potential answers uh, that, uh, that you know one of the multiple choice options do they involve information that's not provided by the article even if it sounds correct because those can be the the ones that um, might potentially catch you out so um we're going to look at an example now um so i will stop showing my screen in just a second so i can send the link uh, into the chat uh, but we're going to look at specimen paper b part a subsection one um, and I want everyone to spend uh, about 10 minutes uh, reading the passage uh, and then uh, we're going to go through some of the questions. So um, I will stop presenting my screen now uh, and then I will send the link to the website. So you should be able to see the link in the meeting chat now. And I'll just share my screen again quickly to show you. 
so when you're on the uh, on the website, you'll land on this page. Um, and there's a tab that says test preparation and practice materials. Go on that. Some videos. So we're just going to scroll down. And under sample papers, um, I want you to open up uh, GATT sample test paper B. And there'll be a PDF document. Uh, and so uh, uh, find uh, what question did I say? Sorry. Yeah, so open that up and find part A, subsection one, please. Keris says nothing in chat yet. Uh, I have I have sent it, Keris. Uh, can, have you, can you see it now? OK, great. So I'm going to pop my camera off and uh, in uh, maybe, yeah, let's do let's do 10 minutes. I'll give you 10 minutes just to read the passage uh, and then we'll talk through some of the questions. Um, so I will be back in 10 minutes.
OK, it's been about 10 minutes, so hopefully everyone has had a chance to uh, read through that passage. Um, someone asked if the session is, uh, would it be possible to access the recording afterwards? Uh, yes, yes, it will be. It'll be sent out and on our YouTube channel. Um, so let's go through some questions then. So question one, uh, so it's an article about Tuvalu. It says, which one of the following statements best summarises the author's understanding of Tuvalu's response to climate change? Um, so maybe we'll do a quick, quick straw poll. So just pop in the chat uh, what you think the answer is for me. Okay, and also B, B, B. Yeah, so looking like B, and you're absolutely right. Uh, the correct answer is B. Um, so the author explains that while Tuvalu is looking at digital options, it would prefer more conventional responses to climate change. Um, so you'll see that a couple of the other um, potential answers uh, were sort of close to this, but there's kind of important uh, nuances between uh, between the statements. So A and E are both a misreading of Tuvalu's response to climate change. So A is saying that Tuvalu believes in the power of new technologies to provide solutions to climate change. That doesn't really come across because they're sort of talking about the metaverse stuff as a as a um, as a I guess you could say a publicity publicity stunt more than an actual response. Um, and E, Tuvalu believes the, that the metaverse is its only possibility for survival in the face of sea level rise. Again, that's not that's not really what comes through from from what the authors say. Um, and so evidence of this is in the second to last paragraph of the passage where the author says it, it's not really about the possibilities of metaverse nations at all. Um, the author does not come to the conclusions expressed in C or D. Um, and C is in fact contradictory to uh, Tuvalu's response. Um, so the fact that you know, Tuvalu is drawing this stuff, it's not accepted that it will just disappear from the world. Um, so hopefully that one makes sense to everyone. Let's move on to question two. Which one of the following statements best reflects the author's main criticism of the idea of a digital twin of a nation state? Uh, so again, just um, pop your answers in the chat for me. D, D, E. Another D. Another D. All right, so we've got mostly D's, uh, a couple of a couple of E's for that one. So the correct answer is D. Um, so uh, D being solutions to climate change, which rely on technology, are often described in ways which obscure the counterproductive use of energy and resources. Um, so just to go through um, the commentary then, uh, A is an argument that is implicit in the points that the author is making, but their main criticism of the digital twin idea as a response to climate change is best reflected by D. Um, so that's where you know it's really important to read um, the question. It's, it might be a criticism, but we're talking about the author's main criticism here. Um, B and C might be true, um, but they're not mentioned by the author. So um, you'll notice that some of the potential answers for these questions say stuff which which sounds sensible and could well be true. And you know maybe if you by chance did know something about the topic. Uh, you might know it to be true, um, but if the author's not saying it in the passage, um, uh, then it's not relevant here. So E is a point that the author makes, um, but is not their main criticism of the idea. Uh, so this is more of an explanation what, of why Tuvalu is proposing a, a digital twin. Um, so, the, so the answer is D. Um, hopefully that makes sense for everyone. If, um, if you put uh, E, uh, hopefully that explains why the why the answer is D. Um, any questions on on that one? Uh, if anyone put a different answer, and wants to query it, um, either pop your hand up or or put it in the chat. Otherwise, we will move on to the next one. Okay, cool. Um, so I've skipped question three. So I'm just doing a selection of questions from uh, from this subsection. I'm not, I'm not doing all five, so I've just gone ahead to question four. Um, which one of the following assumptions does the author's argument depend on most strongly? Um, so we're thinking here about what their what their argument rests on. What are they kind of assuming to be true in order for their uh, argument uh, to be to be valid? 
So uh, A, got a few A's, yeah. Okay, looks like a clean sweep of A's. All right, yep, yeah, so uh, absolutely correct. Uh, the answer is A. So the author's argument that a metaverse nation is not a truly viable response to climate change, um, but it's is being used as a way to draw attention to Tuvalu's situation rests on the author's assumption that Tuvalu is not using the idea of a digital twin as its primary or preferred option for adapting to climate change. Uh, so you're absolutely right. Uh, everyone who, who put A, so the author is assuming that Tuvalu would prefer to remain as a physical nation state through climate mitigation and the preservation of Tuvalu's territory. Um, so uh, just kind of go through a couple of the other options. B might be a reasonable assumption, but it doesn't underpin the author's argument as strongly as A, because um, if, uh, uh, sorry, type it there actually, because if B wasn't the case, Tuvalu might choose to propose a digital twin regardless as a way to attract attention to their cause. Um, uh, There's a question in the chat from uh, Manor. I wanted to ask, are all the passages going to be the same level of difficulty? I found the other paper, subsection A, part one, harder than this. Um, well, no, there will be some variation. Um, the, uh, I think it'll also be sort of some people will find different ones harder than others. Um, so so it will uh, will slightly vary in difficulty. There's no kind of way to to quantify the difficulty of the of the of the passages or the questions. So um, yeah, there probably will be some some variation. Um, but generally, uh, where uh, you know a, one subsection is is harder, um, you can you you might you might be able to expect the other subsection to kind of equal it out a bit and be and be slightly more um, slightly more man manageable. Um, so hopefully that makes uh, sense about that question. Um, so let's move on. Um, other tips for part A. So for questions which ask you to identify an underlying principle, um, which is not one that came up in the examples we've looked at here, but in the other paper, um, there is what there is one or two where uh, it asks you to identify the uh, underlying principle of the author's argument. Um, the correct answer may use information from a diff different context. And what, may, what, what I mean by this is that, um, you know, just as a very sort of abstract rudimentary example, uh, you know, all birds have wings. So penguins are birds because they have wings. Uses the same principle as all fish have fins. So trout are fish because they have fins, even though one statement is talking about birds and one statement is talking about fins, uh, fish. Um, that will make more sense if you look at the other specimen papers uh, and uh, look at the style of question that I mean. Um, so with a question that asks you about an underlying principle, uh, the correct answer might be bring in something from a different context. Um, so yeah, there's a there's an example with with a commentary uh, of the answer on the uh, gap solutions A PDF on the website. Um, Oh yeah, so I've, so I've selected that example out. So this is from uh, specimen paper A. So I ask you which of the following statements best illustrates the principle which underpins the article's argument. Um, so the article itself uh, is about um, uh, earthquakes uh, quake prediction uh, and the possible answers. Um, there's one about weather, one says something about volcanoes, one says something about food and water, one says flood risk management, uh, and one says something about earthquakes. So the answer is A, which is actually talking about weather prediction, even though the article itself is, is, is um, about earthquakes, because it's about the principle um, uh, that under, underpins the argument of the author. Part B, um, so again, we're going to have a little look at the uh, at the past paper. So you should, hopefully you've still got the, um, the PDF up. Um, but before we look at that, uh, let's talk about what we think problem solving ability is. So it's your ability to select relevant information from a uh, from you know a piece of text, uh, a table or figure to find procedures for summarizing or comparing information or to identify similarities between cases. It's also about making judgments on data and deciding what information is useful or not. Uh, so for example, for this one, we're going to look at specimen paper B again, um, part B. Uh, subsection two. So if you open up the PDF um, and um, scroll down to part B, subsection two, please. 
um, and just we'll have a couple of minutes um, to look at that or I have just got the table of data uh, up on the screen now. So uh, just two quick minutes just to have a little look at this information and then we'll go through some of the questions. So if you look to the other um, specimen papers or the other subsection of, of this specimen paper, you'll notice that some of the figures uh, we've taken from published sources, uh, but this one um, is data that was uh, generated for the purposes of this test. Um, so you can see you've got this table of data. Um, there's a paragraph of, of text just to explain what it is. Uh, so it's an investigation into the effect of urban vegetation on mitigating heat in the city centre of Barcelona. Uh, so across the top, you've got the uh, street vegetation index uh, that's between zero and one, the temperature at three times a day, and then the column on the right is the mean afternoon temperature in degrees Celsius. Um, six streets and then uh, the values for, for the vegetation index and the temperature uh, plus the mean temperature, uh, the temperature three times a day plus the mean temperature for each street. Um, so for this kind of question, you look at it and you think, wow, there's a load of numbers here, a uh, load of different things going on, and we're going to need to have to get a calculator out. Um, well, spoiler, the answer is no to that one. Um, so let's have a look at the questions we're asking. Um, so question one on this, which street recorded the highest temperature at uh, 2 p.m. at 1400 hours? That's just a simple matter yeah, B of of picking it out uh, and reading reading from the table which one it is. Street two. Um, number two, which street had the largest range in temperature across the afternoon? Um, so again, this is just a simple matter of uh, look, of kind of looking at the data um, and which um, street had the largest range in temperature across the afternoon. So the answer for number one, street two. Um, Answer B. Uh, question two, the answer is D, street six. Uh, yep, Safina, absolutely correct. So those, those two should be fairly self-explanatory. Um, so let's move on to question three then. Which one of the following variables is not likely to be a factor affecting temperature variations in this research study? So has anyone uh, got an answer for this one? Safina says A. A. Okay. Three A's at the moment. Another A. Okay, fantastic. Yep. Uh, you're absolutely right. If you if you had A as the answer there, altitude above sea level is going to be the, the least likely effect, uh, factor to be affecting this uh, because the information at the start of the question uh, said that it's an experiment into um, uh, into this in the city of Barcelona. So it's all in one city. So, you know, difference in sea level um, across different streets in the same city is likely to be pretty, pretty minimal. Um, and that's, you know, what I mentioned about sort of being common sense rather than outside knowledge. That's not depending on your sort of knowledge of Barcelona, whether it's particularly hilly or not. Um, just as a judgment from the answers that were given here, you know, th that's the least likely to be uh, to be a factor affecting temperature. And all the others could, could possibly uh, could possibly affect it. Um, question four. So this might be one where you look at it and think, oh, you know, is this sort of effect asking me to calculate anything? Um, uh, but the answer the answer is no. So uh, can can you tell me what you think the answer to this one might be? So it's asking you based on a rough judgment of the data, which one of the following statements is most likely to be true? Let's Yeah, OK, everyone's saying C. 
So yeah, the correct answer is C. So a rough judgment of the data. So just by kind of eyeballing it um, for a couple of minutes, you'll be able to see that as vegetation cover increases, average afternoon temperature decreases. So that's a negative correlation. Um, and this is one of those where you can kind of use um, a, a bit of a process of elimination. Um, so there's kind of two, the A and B, strongly and weakly positively correlated. Um, but even before you've kind of thought about, is it, you can either think, first of all, is it positively or negative, more likely to be positively or negatively correlated? And if you think negatively, you can rule out the two ones and say positively. Um, but also strongly or weakly, like you can't really make a judgment on that. Um, and certainly you can't really say it with any kind of um, certainty unless you actually worked that out from the data. And the question is clearly not asking you to do that. Um, so yeah, answer is C. Well done. Question number five then, uh, which one of the following actions would be the least useful improvement for this investigation? Um, which one do we think might be the answer for this? Okay, we got E. Few more E's. OK, so everyone seems to be saying E. And you're right, yeah. So the correct answer is E. Um, so collecting data for evening temperature to give more information on heat on each street throughout the day would not contribute to any additional understanding of the key research question, which is how urban vegetation mitigates heat on the city streets. So it might show that vegetation has different effects at different times of the day, but the key aim is to understand the effect of vegetation on mitigating heat and streets will be clearly warmest in the day. Um, so all of the statements reflect actions which could give some additional information or make the data more reliable. Um, so those are the five questions from that subsection. Um, so as you see, the, the questions on the data aren't really going to be asking you to work anything out. You're not going to be able to do any sort of stats or anything, um, but it will be asking you to make judgment on uh, judgments on the information that is provided. And part of the skill here is really kind of uh, working out what information is relevant, what do you need to worry about in the information that's given and what um, uh, and what is not so important. Uh, so some final tips for part B. Um, yeah, as I mentioned, so part of the skill of answering the question is often realising that not all information is relevant to the questions. Um, they're often easier than they first appear. Uh, if a question appears really hard and many of the potential answers include information that you're finding very hard to work out from the data, it's probably because those answers are not correct. Um, we're not expecting you to calculate anything. Uh, remember, we're testing your ability to respond to information rather than bringing in outside knowledge. Um, so what that kind of means, if you're looking at some answers and coming like, well, how can I possibly tell that from that graph? Well, that's probably not the answer. Um, we're allowed a calculator. Um, we're not we're not asking you to calculate anything. Um, I'd have to double check whether you're allowed one or not in the in the test. Um, I would assume probably not because, yeah, it shouldn't be necessary. Um, but uh, you can double, double check that when, with, the, with the test centre um, before the test. Um, so to talk briefly about part C. Um, so I've included the little sort of blurb that will be with all the part C questions, and it says your answer should be based primarily on the material in the passage. No additional credit will be given for reference to material outside the passage. Um, so what this means is that you're responding to that passage, making judgments, commentary on that rather than, you know, information dumping everything you know about that topic, if you know anything at all, because um, you're not expected to know anything about the topic. So the tips for this are read the passage carefully. You've got you've got about 45 minutes for it, or you should do if you've timed the other parts correctly. Um, the skills that you pick up from doing the part A questions might be useful here. <clears throat> they might not, but they might be. It might help you to sort of uh, think of a few, you know, key points you want to bring out, you know, or at least organize your thinking around. So, um, and, you know, those part A skills, we're thinking about um, what's the argument, what's the conclusion here, um, what evidence are, are they using to sort of back up their, um, their argument. So this clearly is, is probably going to be a very different style of essay to, to what you're used to uh, in school level geography if you do it. 
Um, so um, don't try and kind of write an A level geography essay if you're used to write, if, if you do A level geography, um, because it's very it's, it's very different. Um, you're not expected to have any prior knowledge of the author or topic. You might do. It might be something fairly well known. It might be something you know pretty niche. Um, but remember that the question is asking you to re to rely on the information within the passage rather than uh, bringing in outside information. Um, so there's a 750 word limit. Uh, this is a limit, so it's not a target. So don't worry about your answer being 749 words. Of, you know, um, good answers may well be shorter. Um, there's a question in the chat. Will we be able to see how many words we've written? Uh, yeah, on the online platform. Uh, there's a there's a word count at the bottom of the text box that that shows you live uh, how many words uh, you're on. So uh, it will be uh, you'll be able to easily see the word count. Uh, what happens if you go over the limit? Uh, basically, anything after 750 words won't be taken into account in the uh, in the mark for your essay. Um, there's yeah, that is the answer to that one. Any other questions on part C? Oh, great. Uh, so. What is a marking grid like for the essay? Um, I'm not sure what you mean by marking grid. Uh, I mean, I, I. Are you are you a te are you a teacher or is that from a student's perspective? I, I think I think um, and the mark scheme. OK, well, that's not it's not really that's not really how we're marking them. Um, we uh, we don't really have a marking mark scheme or mark grid. Uh, it will be marked by um, by academic colleagues within the department who uh, are making a judgment on you know how well does this person respond to the information they're given? Can they write clearly and concisely? Are they making uh, good judgments of uh, of the information in the article? Are they using their critical thinking uh, about what the author is saying and the evidence they're using? Um, so there's those are the kind of um, things we're thinking about when marking the essays. But there's there's not a mark there's not a mark scheme for the essays. Um, there are two examples of what we would consider to be a good essay um, that are uh, on the website in with all those practice materials. Uh, so there's the essay responses to the two part C's across the two specimen papers. Uh, so finally, the gap is just one piece of information we'll have on you, so please don't stress too much about it. Um, you know, it's one piece of the puzzle along with your UCAS form, uh, your academic record so far, your predicted grades. Uh, and then should you be shortlisted uh, uh, the interview? Um, it will probably feel harder than any exam that you've done before. It's definitely different to probably most exams you've done before. And that's kind of the point. Um, you know, if you're if you've got the grades to be applying to to Oxford, um, you are likely used to sort of acing every text, every test that, that you've ever done. Um, you know, you, you'd have been get, getting sort of nearly every mark in, uh, you know, in exams right through school probably uh, in order to get the you know the level of mark uh, level of grades that that we asked for um you're probably not going to get that level of of marks right in this test um because we need to differentiate between many different smart people uh so don't be put off if you have a go and and, and get quite a few wrong um so we advise you do the two specimen papers uh with one in exam conditions if possible and, and timed just to get used to the timing uh, and then have a go on the practice online platform to familiarize yourself with actually how it would feel on the day. Um, the online platform won't give you marks or feedback, uh, so if you want to kind of use the online platform as a sort of um, exam conditions test run, uh, I would suggest that you would um, just make a note of uh, of your answers on a piece, piece of paper by the side of you and then check those against the mark scheme uh, at the end. Um, so that's all I wanted to go through. So thanks very much for listening and, and participating. Uh, so we've got lots of time now for questions and answers. Uh, so very happy to take any questions that you might have. Uh, so we've got one in the chat. Um, in terms of admission, how important is the gap result compared to your other grades? Is it a make or break situation if you don't do very well compared to others? Uh, no, it's um, as I mentioned, it's one piece of information that we have on you, so it won't make or break your application in and of itself. 
Can we be provided with paper to take notes, especially in part C? Um, uh, I think that's fine. Um, yeah, double check on the on the sort of general admissions test advice on the university website and with your test centre. Uh, but I'm pretty sure that's that's absolutely fine to have um, uh, to have paper to take notes. Are gap results more valuable than A level results? Um, I can't really answer that question. We don't put a quantitative score on any piece of information. Um, it's more valuable than A level results. No, it's they're, they're just they're two pieces of information that we use to judge uh, candidates. Uh, my school is registered for other Oxford exams, but say they can't do the GAT. Is this right? Um, no, I don't really see why that would be the case. So Ox like a lot of Oxford admissions tests have changed this year. So a really important point actually is that even if your school has uh, has been a test centre for, for, Oxford, for Oxford admissions tests in the past, uh, please, please, please remind them to re they need to re-register and point them towards the, the university website uh, for the information for test centres. Um, if they're registered for the other Oxford exams, they they should be able to do the GAT. Um, if there's if they're still saying there's a problem, uh, tell them to to get in touch with with us ASAP and, and we can work out what that problem is because um you you will need to do the gap to to apply. Everyone who needs who is applying will need to do it. Uh, what do I do if my school is not planning on registering for the gap? Well, um, uh, please tell them to get in touch with us or uh, uh, trying to convince them to because it's it, I don't think it's really it's much um, admin for them. We've tried to make it as as easy as possible. If they really won't do it, then you will have to register to do the test in a different test centre. So there are some private test centres that do it. Um, so there's there's more information on that on the university website on the um, the section on how do I register. Uh, is the one part of the application which is more important than the rest? No, no, it's not. Um, they're all part. They're all you know, different bits of information that we uh, uh, that we use. But you know. I guess clearly uh, you need you need to be predicted the grades to to meet uh, to meet an offer, um, because um, it's a pretty vanishingly small chance of uh, of us making an offer to someone uh, who's not predicted to um, reach the grades of of our standard minimum offer. How do we prepare for part C? Um, have a go at doing the two part C's and the two specimen papers. Um, that's the that's the only thing you can do really. Um, yeah, especially as it's so time restricted. Uh, Seven hundred fifty words is is not a lot. Um, you'll be uh, you'll be surprised by by how much you'll end up writing. But um, I'd say you know have a go at one and then do one in in exam conditions. Um, and that's that's all we're expecting anyone to do is the is the specimen papers and uh, like if you really wanted to maybe you could find some of the passages and have a go at writing a sort of 750 word response to a question that you make up yourself. Um, but uh, but yeah, just the just the two specimen papers should be enough. Uh, is there a website to practice for the GAT or and so you reference the platform? Is that the university website or something different? Um, so it's it's accessed through the university website. So on the um, uh, on the practice resources, there's a kind of there's a blue button and it says practice the admissions test. Uh, and if you go on that, it, it's basically a mock up of what the actual test will look like. Uh, and you're able to have a go at clicking through and selecting the answers and going all the way through and, click, uh, and clicking submit. Uh, but it won't give you a mark back. Um, so maybe I can uh, maybe I can show that to you now, actually. So. Uh, so on the on the page where we access the um, PDFs of the um, specimen papers. This blue button here, practice the online GAT. And so this is the page that you'll see at the start of the real exam. And click uh, start the test. And so this is how the test will actually look when, when you do it for real. Um, so it has, uh, so we're on part A, subsection one, and it has that there. And it has all the answers there, so you, and then you choose your multiple choice answers 
and you click uh, next to move on to the next one. And you can cycle through them like that. So for the essay question, you've got the passage here, the uh, text box here. So you've got the word, you've got the word count down here. There's a few tools as well about that you can like highlight stuff and annotate things on the screen itself. Um, so have a go, have a play around on on that um, because this is you can do this as many times as you like. You don't have to log in. It kind of gives you a sort of mock log in there, um, and your answers aren't aren't saved or, or stored anywhere. And then when you finish, you just click review and submit. And click submit. Um, so I'm just appearing over my laptop. There we go. Okay, so I will scroll back up. Uh, are the two specimen papers the only practices we'll receive? Will there be any other form of similar practice we can find online? They're the only ones. They're the only ones that will be available. There aren't any past papers because it's a new test. Um, the two specimen papers we produced uh, over the last few months. Um, and we've written the real exam now that's kind of going to approval and that and 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 that's it um there won't be any other form of practice we find online because sim simply put no one else knows anything about this test because we've created it uh, for ourselves by ourselves uh, this year um so if that's probably an important point actually if if anyone tries to um say that they've got extra um specimen papers or practice papers and especially if they try and charge them uh, charge for them Ignore them. Uh, they will absolutely not be valid. They will be written by someone who has no idea of this process. Uh, we will be told the results of the GAT before interview. Um, yes, I think so. That was the case with admissions tests previously, so I believe that that is the case. How long is it between the test and finding out about interviews? Um, so you usually find out about uh, decisions on shortlisting. Uh, it's kind of late November time. Um, so it'd be like, um, I can't remember the date of the test off the top of my head, about a month. Uh, is it just registration that has to be completed between 1st and 29th of September? Is there a deadline for actually completing the test? There is There is a day for completing the test uh, that's on the website. I um, can't remember it off the top of my head. Let's take a look. Um, so let's get, get rid of this. So there's a tab there on how do I register that has a lot of information on um, on how the registration process actually works um, and how to find a test center and, uh, and all that kind of thing. Do I take the test? So uh, the date for the GAT is the 19th of October. Will teachers be giving any given any training or support to help the students? Um, this this is the only support I can give you. Um, if there's anything else that you think you need in particular, then uh, please do get in touch with me via email. Um, but there's there's no more additional uh, support or training for teachers that we we have planned because um, you know I, I, there's there's no more information we can really give you. We're not sort of holding anything anything back. Um, do you find out your mark immediately after finishing? Um, uh, no, no, it won't give you your mark immediately after finishing. That will be a, a short time afterwards, um, particularly because it will take us a bit of time to mark the part C. So I don't think you won't get the, the part A and B marked separately. So you'll have to sort of wait a little while for us to mark for part, part C essay questions and then you'll get your result. Do you have a threshold score that we need to get into the gap to qualify for an interview? No, um, as I mentioned earlier on, there's no particular score that you need to get. Um, you'll be judged alongside the other people that are applying at the same time. Um, there's no there's no particular school. Uh, are we likely to discuss the material contained in the test at interview? No, um, the tutors might not have even looked at the, uh, at the test paper because the tutors who are interviewing you uh, might not be involved in, in marking the gap or anything like that. So there's no that that they won't ask you anything uh, about the material contained in the, in the test. If they do, that is pure coincidence. Um, but they they won't sort of think about the the gap um, at interview. Okay. Any more questions?
Fantastic. So, um, well, thanks very much for, for joining. Um, and I hope that was useful. If there's anything you need at the meantime, uh, there's that email there, the inquiries one, or um, the best one I'm just putting in the chat now is the undergraduate dot uh, inquiries at ouc.ac.uk. Uh, so you can get in touch with me uh, via there. Um, as I said, go on the web page that we've uh, been on a couple of times today. Have a look through the videos, uh, have a look through the specimen papers, uh, and please don't stress too much because that's all the preparation we're expecting anyone to do. The point of the admission test is that everyone's on a pretty much uh, even uh, even time scale. So, uh, so yeah, don't worry too much about it. Uh, test is just one piece of information that we'll use, uh, and good luck with your application. Um, so, just one final question before you go. Considering the date of the test is on the 19th of October, while well, the UCAS application deadline is on the 15th of October. Do we have to apply via UCAS first before registering for the GAT? Um, the registration process for the GAT is is separate to UCAS, so they're kind of independent of each other. So, um, so just you need to, uh, you won't have to have submitted your UCAS application before registering for the GAT. No. Uh, great. OK, well, thanks, everyone. Uh, enjoy your evening and I hope to speak to some of you uh, again very soon. Thanks. Bye.